We all seek a promised land, a land of peace and prosperity, a land free from worry and weariness, a land of rest with a faithful leader. But when will it come? How do we find it? Is it possible to enjoy such a place? Take care. Hold fast. Listen. Draw near. Have faith in the one who gives peace to the mind, body, and soul. In our pursuit of a restful land with a faithful leader, Jesus is better. Well, uh, I have decided that I'm going to start out the sermon this morning by saying, well, uh, as I have noticed over the past several weeks looking at the sermons as I've been putting them online, I realize I say the word so a lot. Uh, I think I start out every single week with saying so, uh, so I'm going to say well uh, to everybody looking online. Uh, that's how I'm starting this morning. Hopefully that keeps you on your toes. Um, this morning... We are continuing on in Hebrews, and um, we're going to begin chapter 4. And I'll tell you, uh, last week's message, I think, is probably, uh, I'd indicated this through the announcement email and just sharing it with you guys, that last week's message is probably one of the more important messages um, that I would say I have preached in several years. So I would definitely encourage, if you weren't here last week or you didn't have the opportunity to watch it online, I would strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, to watch that because this week's sermon will kind of make a little bit more sense in terms of where we're going with this um, because last week we talked about the importance of how we keep each other walking with Christ. Uh, the way is narrow, the gate is small, that leads to life, and um, it's a difficult path that we walk. And so this morning um, we're going to talk about what's at the end of that path, the rest that God provides. It's language that the author of Hebrews uses to communicate what we are aiming for. And uh, kind of a funny, funny turn of words that we're going to use here is the importance of striving for rest. Okay, uh, a lot of times we think that rest is simply just checking out. Uh, I know that throughout the week when I want to rest, I'm just kind of like, I'm out I'm watching The Office, and that's it, okay? Usually around 9.30 at night, Rosalie and I will just sit down, and that's going to happen, and then I'm going to pass out at about 10.30, or Rosalie will pass out at 10.30. Either way, somebody passes out at 10.30, and that's kind of how we define rest, but I'll tell you that's not the rest that we're going to be aiming for. The rest that we're going to aim for is a rest that we strive for, and as we think about one of the themes of Hebrews being perseverance, um, it makes sense for us when we think about striving to enter rest, because the rest that we experience is a rest that is on the other side of a race that is well run. And so this morning, we're going to hear the word rest a lot. Um, that's going to be central to what we're talking about, uh, the soul at rest, striving to rest in what God has done. Hebrews 4, 1 through 13 is the passage we're looking at. Let me read this for us this morning as we begin. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands... Let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since, therefore, it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he appoints a certain day today, saying, through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us, therefore, strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience for the word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword piercing to the division of soul and of spirit of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart and no creature is hidden from his sight but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account so here's where we're going this morning 
the soul at rest is the soul that strives to rest in the work that God has already done and to be satisfied in what he has said about who he is, what he has done, and what that means for us. So the soul at rest is the soul that strives to rest in the work that God has already done and to be satisfied in what he has said about who he is, what he has done, and what that means for us. So uh, last week, we talked a little bit about the family history, the people of Israel, uh, as they walked through the wilderness, and there was uh, what we'll call the wilderness generation. Um, I'm not going to cover this in extensive detail this morning, because we talked about it last week, but this wilderness generation that uh, tested God repeatedly, uh, and it was not a test where they were saying, God, I I need help, I need assistance. It was a test where they were basically antagonizing God and telling God that uh, if he really loved them, then he would treat them a certain way. And I think uh, for all of us, as we kind of go into this morning, thinking about what it means for us as Christian people, as, as somebody who uh, has made a profession of faith in Christ, that is you, then you look at yourself and you think, well, clearly I'm not like the Israelites. And there's a sense in which that's true. Uh, There's a sense in which you are definitely not like the Israelites because uh, you are most likely not out completely just shaking your fist in God's face on a regular basis. But I will say that for us as Christian people, there are experiences, there are seasons and times in life in which it is very easy to feel the same sort of pull on the heart that says, I don't understand what God is doing. And because I don't understand what God is doing, it is much easier for me to question what he has said about who he is and how he is disposed toward me in his word. And so as we look at this, as we continue on looking at Hebrews 4, and you're tempted to think that the the rest that's being spoken of is a rest that's just reserved for these people who were out in the wilderness and being complete clowns or people who in the first century were being written to were saying, I just don't know about the Jesus thing. I don't want to really be known for that anymore. Um, That may not define any of us, but there's still the same heart attitude, a heart disposition that basically says that this persevering Christian life When things get difficult, and the longer you live the Christian life, the more you realize that it's not easy, it is difficult, there are hard things that you encounter that you feel as though um, it is almost impossible for you to get through a situation without sinning. To just understand that this call to enter the rest of God stands for us every single day. And it's a call that continually comes to us, a call that says you have need to aim for not just uh, a sense of rest that you have right now, but to recognize that the rest that's promised to us is a rest that's promised to us after we are done in this life. Um, There's a tension that theologians talk about called the, the already not yet, okay? There's a tension between the already and the not yet. The fact that we experience so many blessings of being the people of God already, but there are certain things that we have not yet experienced. You have not yet experienced a complete freedom from sin. That's not going to be experienced until you go home to be with Christ. You have not experienced the, uh, we'll use a real fancy word here, the beatific vision, which is the sight of Christ without any sin in the way. You've not experienced that yet. So there are certain things that we are looking forward to. And so what I would draw our attention to this morning is the sense that not only do we experience the rest that God provides us now with a sense that we have been forgiven and that we have freedom from sin in in that it no longer enslaves us, but I also want us to see that these, these moments of rest that we experience are moments that ultimately direct us to persevere looking forward to a rest that will be final and eternal. Um, it's, I, I, I listened to somebody this, this past week in preparation for the sermon. He was talking about how he hears people at funerals say things like, oh, well, may he rest in peace and that kind of a thing. And what he was saying is that, you know, oftentimes they'll hear that and they'll just kind of smile and nod nicely. But the reality is that um, there are many people, when we say that about, that will not rest in peace because the rest in peace that is spoken about in Scripture is a rest that is given to those who, by the grace of God, persevere in faith, persevere in trust in Christ. And for those who do not do that, they will end up, as this wilderness generation did, people who may have heard the good news, maybe who have heard uh, the Bible spoken, who've heard about Jesus, and yet they failed to enter that rest. 
So there's certainly that warning out there, but what I would have us do this morning is have this kind of be a cause for perseverance. We look to Jesus and come to Jesus and recognize the rest that he gives to us is a rest that we experience a little bit now and completely and fully and perfectly later. And to not trade out a sense of just present comfort for eternal rest and peace. So that's where we're going. A history lesson continued, Hebrews 3, 16 through 4, verse 2. We're backing up a little bit here to last week, again, to give you the perspective of what we talked about. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. As I just said, this is the definition of those who do not find the rest, the eternal rest in God. Those who fail to enter because of unbelief. It's important to understand that. Continuing, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, that us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listen. So again, to kind of restate what I just mentioned, the rest promised by the gospel is a rest marked by perseverance and trust in the word and work of God. Um, we'll reference this in the months ahead as we continue on through Hebrews, but Hebrews is a book that is marked out with a real sense of concern for those who have made a profession of faith and who walk back from it. And I wonder if, as we go through this book, I don't want you to stare at yourself in a mirror and get terrified, okay? I want you to stare at yourself in the mirror in the morning and say, well, this could be me, this is awful, this is awful, this is awful. I don't want you to live with that sense of fear, all right? God calls us to live with a sense of confidence and joy in the gospel and rest and peace in the gospel, but there are reasons for concern at times, and this letter draws out those reasons for concern, but what I'd like for you to do as we go through the book of Hebrews is perhaps you know somebody that can be described by this passage that we're looking at. Perhaps you know somebody who um, made a profession of faith. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a, 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 a former classmate, current classmate. Um, you know, maybe it's somebody at work think about somebody like that and, and think about their life and think about the course of their life and how it's gone out and realize that the book of Hebrews is not simply talking in theoreticals here. The book of Hebrews is not simply speaking about, well, if this, then this. The book of Hebrews is talking about people who really and seriously made a profession of faith in Christ. And as we work through the book later on, um, there is severe language used to describe somebody who makes a profession of faith in Christ and walks back from it. Um, nothing short of saying they, they've trampled the blood of the Son of God under their feet. You imagine taking Jesus' precious blood and spitting on it and stomping on it and saying this is worthless, and that's what the author of this letter is communicating. And so when you think about entering that rest, when you think about uh, what this might mean, I, I don't, again, just want you to think about yourself here. I want you to think about somebody that this describes, uh, not for you to think what a terrible human being, what a terrible situation that is, but for you to think there are real consequences. And for us, just to be clear, to think, as I hear these calls, that seem to be somewhat perhaps misdirected because you feel like things are going well with you and the Lord, and they probably are. But for you to be careful and for you to watch and for you to look and to consider, is there anything in my life that might be reflecting or resembling what I've seen in this other person? Because unbelief is a sneaky thing. Unbelief comes in and it creeps in and it causes us to start questioning the authority of God's word, which is why, as we hear the author of this letter saying over and over, he talks about, as God has said, as God has said, as God has said. And we want to pay attention to what God has said. So our confidence is in that. The rest promised by the gospel is a rest marked by perseverance and trust in the word and work of God. There are many people that this is not true of. And I want you to think of their course of life 
and think, where has it gotten them? And as the call comes to you to exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, as we talked about last week, as, as the scripture comes to you and says to continue to come to Jesus and rest in who he is and trust the promise of rest to come, I want you to think, what are the consequences of not listening? Because they are real. And you don't want to be somebody that's thought of the same way you're thinking about this former friend or coworker. So a word of instruction there. Go back to Numbers 14, 36, 38. Just a little bit here again. And the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing up a bad report about the land. The men who brought up a bad report of the land died by plague before the Lord. Of those men who went to spy out the land, only Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh remained alive. So that's the, the history, and we're going to move forward in history a little bit here to see a situation that reflects this type of a thing, because as the people wandered through the wilderness, they constantly questioned whether God's purpose for them was a good purpose. They constantly questioned, is what God is doing good? Is what God is doing trustworthy? Is what God is doing something that I can bank my life on? And this is what was experienced by the people of Israel as they wandered through the wilderness, and there was really a wholesale rejection of God's promise throughout that time. So you have a people who, an entire generation, are wiped out because they said, God, we don't trust you, we don't believe you, it would be better for us if we had anything other than you. And if you don't give us the anything we want, then we don't care about what you said. And so God finally consigned them to that. So moving forward in history, then I want you to see something from Jesus' earthly ministry that uh, gives us a picture not only of how this type of situation exists throughout history, but I want you to see how it more clearly reflects the heart. And not just the heart as we relate to God generically. Because I think sometimes it's easy for us to think about God and to think uh, God, maybe small g, God out there abstract. But I think when we think about Jesus, sometimes we have a little bit clearer of a picture because we can picture Jesus and we can, we can see Jesus as it were walking with people. And I think the rejection of Jesus' love and care may, may make it a little bit more personal for us sometimes than just the people of Israel wandering through the wilderness. So John chapter 6, I'm going to read this to you. It's a big passage, so here we go. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. Jesus went up on the mountain and they sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This indeed is the pro this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now growing up for me, uh, growing up in a mainline Protestant church, uh, I grew up hearing this story. And thinking about Jesus and, and thinking that the point of this story was, look at the wonderful things that Jesus can do. Look at all of these great things that Jesus has done. And growing up hearing the same type of story about the people going through the wilderness and the Israelites and watching Charlton Heston and, and the Ten Commandments and all this good stuff. Um, when you think about these stories, you think about, well, isn't this great? Isn't this nice? Look at these things that God has done. And yet what happens is we fail to finish the story. We fail to follow up with the fact that the stories that we read about God doing miraculous things many times are not stories that highlight for us the fact that God can do these things because throughout Scripture it's assumed. It's assumed that God can do great and remarkable things, but instead 
many times when you see these great remarkable things done, it's to highlight something. And it's to highlight the fact that the relationship that we have with God is often set on our own terms. And that when God does a great and remarkable thing like feeding the 5,000 here, it's not simply to show us that he is who he is, but it's also to reveal to us something about ourselves. And so as we continue on with the passage, Jesus' interpretation, as it were, as he communicates with the people, starting in verse 22. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so you see here this interaction that Jesus has with the people, with these Jewish individuals who were saying, well, clearly we see that you are a prophet. Clearly we see that you do these remarkable things. And they come to him, and Jesus, knowing the hearts of men, says to them, I will tell you exactly why you are seeking me right now. And it's not because you are seeking me. It's for the very same reason that your forefathers sought me in the wilderness. And it was not a seeking of God. It was a seeking of God's benefits. And so for us, as we think about what it means to strive to enter the rest, again, going back to the idea of having a... Um, a, a funeral where you're hearing rest and peace. I think, what, how do we define the rest that we're seeking? Again, going back to, to, to my typical restful evening of passing out, watching the office, that's restful to a degree. It's not necessarily satisfying because I'll wake up with a, a, a sore neck and a little bit dazed, wondering where I am. Um, that'll happen. So is it really restful? Well, to a degree. And, and so for us, when we think about people talking about rest and people resting in peace and going to that funeral, so often we'll hear things like, well, we know that uh, Joe loved the Packers. And we know that Joe is going to be up there cheering on the Packers every Sunday. Now, that might sound restful to us here and now. Um, probably not going to be restful this year because I'm not too hopeful about the Packers this year. Uh, some people may disagree with me, but I'm not excited. Um, but when it comes to thinking about rest, we define it on our own terms. And so as we're seeking things from God, you think about the people of Israel thinking, okay, we want to enter the, the promised land. What is that promised land? They're saying, take us right there and take us right there to a place where we don't have to worry about anything. And as, as the people approached Canaan, they approached a place where they have these giant people, huge people, bigger than me probably, a whole lot bigger than me. They're wandering around, scaring everybody, grapes as big as their heads, things like that. They're wandering around and they're like, oh, we can't go in there. We can't go in there because their definition of rest meant that they just went and coasted. They just went in there and it was fine, whatever. 
And so they were terrified that when God promised them rest, that it meant they actually had to strive to enter rest. It was different than the definition. And when the people here that Jesus is interacting with come across the statement Jesus is making about coming to him, they think, well, this isn't the kind of bread we're seeking. We want, we want bread, Jesus. Give us bread, real, real bread that we can eat. So they're defining it differently. And then for us, as we think about rest, what it means to enter the rest that God provides, and this passage that's calling us to get a sense of that, doesn't mean that rest for us as Christians is just an everyday sense of peace and joy and happiness and puppies. And the answer is no. Because to understand the rest that we're called to, we need to understand how God defines that. Throughout history, humanity has convinced itself that God's purpose is to provide for us our distorted definitions of what is good on terms that require a commitment from God to us instead of the other way around. And it's really that last phrase I want you to kind of think about is the fact that for us, when we consider the things that we want from God, we're often more convinced that God should persevere toward us than we should persevere toward God. That in order for God to do what is right, he needs to prove himself with us. That he needs to convince us that he is worth letting be a part of our experience. Instead of listening to him and thinking, I don't want to be like the Israelites. I don't want to be like the Pharisees. I don't want to be like the friend of mine who didn't get what he wanted from Jesus and so he backed off and walked away. Instead, I want to think about it from God's terms. So what is the rest that we need? Hebrews 4, 3 through 10 says this. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest, since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, and the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for whoever has entered God's rest is also rested from his works, as God did from his. The rest that the Israelites saw was the rest of a land flowing with milk and honey, absent of God. The rest that we need is a rest in what God has rested in, namely his own work and promise. So there's, a, there's kind of a, a concept, there's a theme that if you haven't heard me talk about it before, you haven't heard other pastors talk about it, it's an important one to understand. When we think about what is it for God to be satisfied? What is it for God to be happy? And what I want you to understand about that, because it's easy for us to kind of miss the point on it, when we think about what it is for God to look at something and be happy, for God to do that, the, the most happy that God can be is for God to be happy in himself. The most satisfied God can be is for God to be satisfied in himself. And the reason being is, if God looks at himself, he sees perfection. If God sees himself and he sees his works, he sees that he has done something good. So even though we may get a sense of God's pleasure in the things that we may do to honor him, think that ultimately what God is pleased with is to look at his own work and say it is good. So we're going to see this here as, as it shows up in Scripture. It shows up right away. So this is not a strange concept for people as we think about this truth. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So as the writer of Hebrews quotes this, he probably wants us to think about it and think where it comes from. Where does it come from, you may ask? You probably know, so I'll read it. Genesis 1, starting in verse 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. So th this is not going to be uh, a message about the importance of taking a Sabbath, although I would say it is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important 
that you take one day out of seven to rest from your earthly labors. Um, people have different interpretations of that. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be up here advocating for you know, some super strict view. Some people don't watch football on Sundays. I love watching football on Sundays, so maybe I'm wrong about that, but hey, there we go. Um, but what I would say is important, most important, is that in your heart you carve out one day out of seven to say, the way I usually go about making my living, the way I usually go about doing my business, I'm going to stop for one day. And there are many reasons for this, but a primary one is to consider that if God was pleased after six days to rest from his work, then we can absolutely be pleased to do the same. And if the one who upholds creation can after six days say, I'm done, then us who uphold nothing can do the same. So there's just a little plug here. Again, it's not me a message going to be about the taking a Sabbath day each week, but again, I want to encourage you to consider the fourth commandment has not ceased. Okay? The fourth commandment has not ceased. It looks a little different than it may have looked for the people of Israel as they're wandering around in the wilderness, but the fourth commandment has not ceased. Jesus himself said that man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man. So if you want to experience a good gift from God, consider one day out of seven he's given you to say you don't need to worry about anything today. So there's my little plug for that. But getting back to this specifically, getting back to what we're talking about here, I want you to see in verse 31 something that we talk about sometimes when we think about creation, but it's important for us to understand in the context of what we're talking about here with God being satisfied in his work. Because in verse 31, Moses records this, that when God saw what he had made prior to sin entering the world, he says that it was very good. Okay, uh, I think the Hebrew for it actually is just a repetition of the word tov. It just means good, good. It's like this is really good. When God saw what he had made, he was happy with it. He was pleased with it. And so as we consider what is God happy and what is God most happy in, as we move towards this idea of God defining for us what is rest, what is he happy in, and how can we be happy in the same thing he is happy in so that we can rest the way we're called to, we get this sense right away from the first chapter of the Bible that God looks at his work and his work untainted from human sin and failure is very good. And throughout scripture we see that God regards his own work as very good. Psalm 104 says this, may the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him for I rejoice in the Lord. So here you have the psalmist reflecting really on two themes. The first theme is that God, may he rejoice in his works. He's saying, may God look at what he has done and may he rejoice. May he take joy and pleasure in what he has done. And then you see what is the human response. The psalmist is saying, I want to do the same thing. I want to rejoice in what God has done. I want to look at the character of God, and I want to be happy. I want to be joyful. And isn't that something that we absolutely need to do? Um, I can't tell you how many, I'll call it frustration points I've registered. On the scale of 1 to 100, I'm probably at like 98 right now, circumstantially, with everything going on in the world. Tension scales are way, way, way up there. Don't we need to take a look at something that is unchanging and that promises to bring us joy and peace and to kind of erase tension points? Here, the psalmist makes it really clear to us that if we want joy, that we can surely get it, not just from looking at our circumstances, being happy with some things here and there, but looking at God and what he's done. John chapter 6, verse 35 through 40. Again, I want you to see how this is reflected in Jesus' words. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So what is it then that we see here Jesus reflecting, but the fact that what is God pleased with? Because early in the passage he talks about what is it to do the will of God, and it's to believe in the one whom he has sent. So what is it to do something that God is happy with? It's to look on God himself and say, I'm happy with that. And here he says that, that the will of the Father, this is what makes God the Father really happy. It's to look on the Son. God the Father is really, really, really pleased when we look on Jesus and we say Jesus is enough. And you think about these people in Hebrews that are, are this letter is being written to and they're being tempted to say Jesus is not enough. Jesus is not as good as... And you think, really what they're aiming for is the displeasure of God, a sense of, of aimlessness and restlessness. There's no peace to be found in seeking peace outside of Jesus because Jesus says here, the will of the Father is that whoever looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, eternal rest. John 19 records this. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, this is Jesus hanging on a cross, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst a jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. A right relationship with God and the promise and experience of rest is built on a satisfaction in what God has been satisfied in with the gospel. When Jesus said, it is finished, he said, everything that needed to be done is done. If you were to go to a party and you decided at this party that, you know, you, you heard and you got this text from the, the host of the party saying, hey, you know what, I've got everything ready now. I'm so excited to, to welcome everybody here. Just bring yourself, show up, and, and just enjoy what I've done. I'm so excited, so pleased and proud of the work that I've done. And you show up and you, you begin to just kind of tinkering around what they've done and say, I don't think I really like this. I don't like that. Um, I'll do an office reference here. Maybe you guys remember the episode of The Office where Michael goes to uh, David Wallace's house for the first time and it's this big catered event and he brings this potato salad that sat in his car all day. <laughs> nasty, nasty, nasty stuff. And so David Wallace's wife is, is talking to Michael and Dwight and they're like, oh, hey, we brought this because they're thinking, well, surely I need to bring something to this event to contribute to it and it's just this nasty disgusting thing in the midst of this huge course of food that was catered beautifully prepared good to eat and everything like that and perhaps if we thought about what we do when we come to Jesus and we say we need to rest that we contribute to it might seem like that would be a good example of what it looks like that we bring this rancid potato salad to this really well catered event and when Jesus said, it is finished, he said, I've done everything for you to be happy. I've done everything for you to be satisfied. I've done everything for you to be at peace and to experience rest. So why in the world would you want to either find rest somewhere else or come to me and say that there's something you need to do to provide for that for yourself? For us to relate, relate rightly with God means that we need to be satisfied in what God has been satisfied in, and that's his own finished work. Again, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So the rest for the resting, that's us, those who profess faith in Christ, people who think, you know what, we're resting, resting, resting. How does it apply to us? Well, I will tell you, especially as we move toward a time of communion this morning. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Hearing God's voice in Scripture, and Scripture through God's people, continually provokes us towards striving for the promised rest, even as we rest in the promise here and now. So, as a church, we certainly don't celebrate the idea of raise a hand, pray a prayer, write your name on a card, and that just gets you saved and whatever. Just have fun, feel great, and get to the end of your life. Like, oh, I prayed that prayer when I was however old. And uh, it doesn't matter that I've lived in debauchery or whatever the past 40 years. It doesn't matter at all because I prayed that prayer and that pastor told me, oh, I'm all, I'm all good. Okay, 
we're not that kind of church. But there's something that exists in the heart of every human being that really easily slips into feeling a sense of false security. It's very easy for us to think things are going well, circumstances are going well, and so I guess I'm okay. And what I would challenge us to consider is that the Christian life is not one where we simply say, I'm okay. But for lack of a better term, the, the, the Christian life is one in which we are constantly pushing forward and we're not satisfied with where we're at. Where we say, my walk with Jesus might be great compared to so-and-so, but Jesus did not call me to coast. And that's a temptation all of us fall into. Every single one of us falls into that temptation to think, I'm good. And so I, I'm just, I'll have my seven minute quiet time and I'm good. And you know what? It's not like you're going to go to hell because you decide I'm going to have a seven minute quiet time instead of 15. That's not the point. The point is God does not call us to be happy with just saying I'm okay. But he calls us to strive to enter that rest because sin is always attacking us. Our hearts are always deceiving us and failing us in the process of moving towards glory. And so as we continue to move forward in time, we have to be careful that we don't get a false sense of security. And this is why the church is so absolutely important. It's because in the church, you see one another and you are able to detect things that other people may not see for themselves. It is so critical that we are in a type of fellowship that says, I see what's going on with you. And for you to be willing to share yourself with other people. And that can be scary. It can be difficult because we don't like to be called out for doing things that are wrong. We don't like to be seen for perhaps uh, what we fear people will see about us. But just as the word of God is living and active and it exposes us, we're naked before the sight of God, there's a sense in which we need to be willing to have the same attitude of I am willing to be exposed, my heart exposed to other believers. And that's not for you to feel condemned. It's not for you to feel like, you know what, I'm just terrible and they're going to see me and they're going to see the worst about me. They're going to throw me away even though the temptation most of us feel. But it's for the same reason why you go to Scripture and you read Scripture and it's so that you can be changed. It's not fair for you to go to the Bible and say, I'm just going to read the passages that speak to me. This is why we work through the Bible, why we read the Bible for what it is, the whole Bible cover to cover, is because we know that we're going to come across a passage that makes us uncomfortable. And in the same way as we relate to other Christians, perhaps there's going to be a conversation you have that's uncomfortable, but it's uncomfortable because it's good for you to grow. It's good for you to change. And that other brother or sister might step into a place that you absolutely need in that moment. And so as we strive to enter the rest of God, there are situations that we're going to encounter that we have to say, I need to be exposed for this individual to see me so that I can actually grow unless I become stunted in my growth and grace. And the only way that we can do that is if we hear God's word spoken to us directly and as we hear God's word spoken through his people to us indirectly. This is absolutely necessary for the Christian life. And why I would say, get your butt in church as often as you can. I just can't stress that enough. Be in here as often as you can. Don't neglect the thing that will keep you walking and not just walking but growing because God calls us to grow. I'm not saying you need to be here and wash the windows every day. I'm just saying if you have opportunity and you can make it, do what's best for you and not only what's best for you but what's best for others because people need your ministry to them just as much as you need their ministry to you. Remind you again from last week, take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, 
as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. And that's our goal. That's our hope. We hold our original confidence firm to the end. And we do that as we encourage one another, as we exhort one another, as we do the things God has called us to do. And that is a loving thing. That is a wonderful thing. And we can rest securely knowing that God is working in us and through us as his people.